it is my joy to be with you here in the Grove tonight, and particularly to have the opportunity to surprise Mike Shun, which is not an easy thing to do. But I'm full of surprises. It's kind of the joy of being a black woman in America. We go back a long way. I remember the last big event that we had at the Grove. It didn't look like this. I also remember working with Mike and several other folks who are here tonight whose names I won't even try to call because there are so many. But I remember when we called it something other than AIDS and HIV. I remember GRID. I remember ARC. I remember when AZT was Compound Q. And I remember Sylvester. <laughs> and I remember the parties up and down Castro Street. And I remember being a part of one of the first faith-based organizations that wanted to remove the stigma associated with HIV. That was a lot of years ago. And I want to say that Mike Shriver and I have been connected at the hip for a long time. And I know Mike's not the only person being honored tonight, but I get an opportunity to shock him. And he looks so cute. He's got a new haircut. He just looks fabulous. And I'm just so glad to see him. And so I wanted to surprise him with one other thing. Not only these words to share, but I sang for a period of time with a group called Chanticleer. I called them my deacons for a long time. We recorded together at midnight at a church here in San Francisco and the Warner label and received the Grammy Award for that recording. And it is my joy just to sing a verse in a chorus. Where you might wave your hand. There it is. For you. So my name is Eric Chisulo, and I'm quite privileged to be a board member. It's my, it's my great privilege to be a board member of the National AIDS Memorial. And I get the special privilege tonight of thanking our dear friend, a leader in our community for so many decades, a woman of incredible gifts, um, Reverend Bishop Yvette Blunder, for sharing her gift of song with us tonight. Thank you, Bishop Plunder. Good evening, my name is Pat Christen. I'm delighted to be co-chairing this evening with Eric and privileged to be a longtime supporter of the National AIDS Memorial Grove. And I would be so grateful if the people in the back of the room would be quiet. supporters, including Quest Diagnostics, again, providing presenting sponsorship this year. I'd like to ask Dr. Rick Pisano to join us on stage. Dr. Pisano is Vice President and Medical Director for Global Market and Precision Medicine at Quest Diagnostics. He's also a renowned international expert on therapeutics and diagnostics for infectious diseases including HIV and HCV. Dr. Pisano. Uh, thank you very much. And on behalf of Quest Diagnostics, I would like to thank all of you for coming together tonight to support the National AIDS Memorial Grove. Quest has been honored to be a sponsor and work with and be a part of the National AIDS Memorial Grove for the past five years. The Grove plays a special role in remembrance of lives lost to AIDS, but also to our individual and collective healing. It has also helped raise awareness and to build a community. 
and that's evidenced by what we see here tonight. As a physician who practiced in the Bay Area for many years, I saw the impact of AIDS epidemic on patients and friends. I could not be more proud to be joining all of you in a space dedicated to remembrance and healing. All of us in this room have a shared commitment to honoring those lives lost to the AIDS epidemic, but also to provide exceptional care so that people live full and healthy lives, and also to prevent new HIV infections. This shared commitment is critical because we know that too many people are still not getting the care they need. Too many people do not know their status, so they cannot start treatment. In fact, the most recent study available from the CDC, the C CDC of approximately 1.1 million people infected with HIV, one in seven do not know their status. This reinforces the importance of the theme that the United Nations has selected for this year's World AIDS Day, Know Your Status. At Quest, helping people know their status allows them to take action to be healthy at the core of what we do. And, but there's more work to be done. While we have seen declines in new infections overall, the results have been uneven and some groups have even shown increases. Making sure that everyone knows their status and that we reach all groups will take all of us working together. At Quest Diagnostics, we could view our role as a laboratory as one that is very limited, defined by the lab tests we offer, screening for HIV, supporting prevention measures such as PrEP, and for making sure that providers have the tools they need to treat and diagnose their patients correctly. However, we believe that this is too narrow of a view. We need to view ourselves as part of a broader community that extends beyond clinics, hospitals, and laboratories. Collaboration among organizations, individuals, and communities is what will help us improve health. The theme for World AIDS at the National AIDS Memorial World is Voices of Hope. I think that's very fitting as we think about what we can bring our voices together and collaborate so that we can achieve a healthier and more hopeful future. The world is an organization that embodies that idea of collaboration and of voices of hope. Whether it is tending the gardens or pulling weeds on a daily basis, when you're side by side with members of various community groups, or it's attending a group function such as this, it unites the community. The AIDS Memorial Grove is an organization that brings us together. It brings us together for remembrance, for healing, and for building community. When Quest joined the National AIDS Memorial Grove for a healing circle before this year's AIDS Walk in San Francisco, you could see that the Grove was in many ways a connecting fabric between different individuals and organizations. At Quest, we are very honored to be a part of that community. Again, we extend a heartfelt thank you for the opportunity to join together tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pisano and Quest Diagnostics. I also want to thank um, the other, uh, our other um, supporters this evening. Joining Quest is Chevron, Gilead, Wells Fargo, and Macy's. Thank you for making this night possible. So I'm still Eric Chisulo, and I want to welcome you um, to this beautiful, sacred, joyful space. Um, I have to acknowledge that it is a special privilege to co-host this evening with Pat Kristen uh, on a night when we're honoring Mike Shriver. Um, 
I can't think of two people that I admire more, and there are very few people on this planet that I admire as much. And so this is a very special night to have both of them on stage. This is the National AIDS Memorial, and it's a place to, where we provide a place of remembrance for lives of people, so that the lives of people with AIDS aren't forgotten, and so the story is known by future generations. That being said, it's also a uniquely San Francisco space and a uniquely San Francisco story. Just like we rose from the ashes of the fire of the early 20th century, this is a community that rose up in community from the ashes of the wildfire that was the AIDS epidemic of the 80s and early 90s. And the Grove itself is a story of renewal and rejuvenation. Many of you know that this was a place that had been forgotten, neglected. It was a dumping point. And after over 100,000 hours of volunteer service, it's been transformed into a garden of tranquility, serenity, peace, and healing. And tonight when we gather under a million lights on a night that somehow isn't pouring rain, And as we look out at this beautiful crowd, and I'm thinking maybe butterflies, not phoenix. Um, Y'all looking beautiful. Um, the Grove is a place where sometimes we come alone to reflect, to remember, to refresh our spirits, but it's also, and importantly, a place that we come to together. We grieve together at memorials. We celebrate together at weddings. Tomorrow, World AIDS Day, we'll solemnly remember those who passed as we recommit ourselves to the future. It's a place where we dance spectacularly to disco music with the butterfly wings of flagging. And tonight, it's a night when we do all those things. Pat's going to enumerate some of Mike's incredible accomplishments and his incredible gifts to our community in this epidemic. But I would be remiss if I did not say a few words. And um, Mike's the first friend I made in San Francisco. And he's been one of my dearest friends for 30 years. And beyond his soaring and majestic intellect, beyond his seemingly endless capacity for service to his recovery communities, the AIDS communities, long-term survivors communities, now the Jewish community, who don't you serve? He has the humility and the tenacity as a facilitator, which I think is one of his most extraordinary gifts. Despite being often the smartest person in the room, he manages to bring out the strengths and the insights and the brilliance of people around him. You find a way to forge consensus, even among incredibly disparate opinions and points of view. Your endless belief in people and community unleashes power in community and coalition as much now as it ever did in the days of ACT UP. In my personal life, he's been a catalyst for my activism, and I know for many of you as well. And even though he'll be the first to say that I'm much, much, much older than him, he's been a mentor to me as long as I've known him. As a friend, the consistency of support that he's shown me and scores of you in this room, the deepening in wisdom and compassion that you've displayed over this last number of years, and the fact that you can still make me laugh out loud like no one I've ever met, makes you a treasure to me and to this community. Mike, I cherish you. Congratulations on this honor that's so well deserved.
Mike Schreiber's picture should be featured next to the word resilient in the dictionary. I, I'm, I'm going to once again just ask the folks in the back if they could just quiet down. I so badly want to honor this man and would like so much for folks to pay attention to him. Thank you. I'm going to start again. Mike Shriver's picture should be featured next to the word resilient in the dictionary. Ann Maston, who has studied resilience extensively, calls it ordinary magic. This wellspring capacity we have to prevail in the face of extraordinary hardship and suffering. It turns out there are three characteristics quite common to those who are most resilient. Mike is rich in all three. First, resilient people have a deep sense of purpose for something outside themselves, something larger than themselves. Mike's work with the Ryan White Planning Council, AIDS Watch, Needle Exchange, Mobilization Against AIDS, the San Francisco Health Commission, the National AIDS Memorial Grove, 18th Street Services, the list goes on and on and on. And it's emblematic. It is emblematic of this type of purpose. Mike Shriver lives on purpose. Next, resilient people have a profound sense of connection to others. Mike is a natural connector, a masterful web weaver. Locally, nationally, globally, he connects us to one another and to others. Knowing together, we can accomplish that which we could never accomplish alone. Finally, resilient people have a sense of agency, a belief they can make a difference in the face of the challenges before them. They do not give up. Mike Schreiber does not give up. Purpose, connection, agency, this is the recipe for resilience. The keys to unlocking magic. Mike Schreiber is a magical person. You need not take my word for it. You can see it for yourselves. Please direct your attention to the video monitors for a special tribute to this exceptional man. AIDS is the leading cause of death of all Americans ages 25 to 44. And for me, it is a very personal, personal issue. I work at the National Association of People with AIDS. My name is Mike Schreiber, and I'm a gay man who is living with HIV disease. If I had to describe Mike in one word, it would be steadfast. Compassion. Survivor. Pioneer. Fearless. Smart. Irreverent. Hilarious. Indomitable. And unsick. You'll hear many people talk about his incredible policy acumen, amazing ability to take disparate points of view and help forge really compelling public policy. What struck me about him was how deep his knowledge and understanding was, as well as how broad it was. He had a really clear vision of what a just response to the epidemic could look like and how, as a community and as a people, we could fight and win. Mike never gave in and he never gave up. The thing that I really appreciated about Mike was his ability to make people feel seen, to make people feel welcomed into coalition, and to work with a wide variety of people. He had an understanding of how different um, HIV was impacting different communities and how prevention was important in each community. And I wanted to stand with him. And I want it to be like him. Um, I still do. Mike's had a huge impact on me personally. He has been my rock. Michael was someone I could trust. He embodies love. 
Mike has taught me that it's important to take service work and helping your community really seriously, but also equally as serious is the amount of fun that you should have doing it. This ability to see the joy in life and frankly to, to make us all laugh at times when, when things were very dark. I have so appreciated all of our discussions about um, not only public health, but art, music, and even dogs over the years. What do I love about Mikey? Everything. Mike, congratulations. The fact that you're being honored tonight is so well deserved. You are truly a bright light among human beings. Congratulations. And no, I'm really proud of you. I'm very lucky to be able to call you my brother. I love you. Love you. I love you, Mike Shriver. On behalf of your friends here in Washington, we cannot wait to see what you accomplish next. Welcome our friend, our hero, Michael D. Schreiber. to make. Uh, I, I often pride myself as having no feelings. Uh, my friends don't know this. Uh, I am definitely having a feeling. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. I'm not comfortable with it. Um, but I will say that uh, if I could just stand here and cry for five minutes, I would hope that would express how much this means to me. Uh, Everyone else, people know me. I, I wrote notes. I'm, I'm going to ignore almost all of them. Uh, oh. So, I think it's quite amazing that I got the Grove to throw a party for me to thank you all. No, I, and I actually mean that most sincerely because when I look out of this room, you're the people that I fought with, you're the people that I love, you're the people that I've married that have brought me into organizations that have seen me at my best and seen me at my worst. You're the people that helped me get sober. You're the people that helped me run agencies. You're the people that helped me when I fall down, literally and figuratively. You are, you're everything. I hope you know that. I hope you get a chance to look around the room and if the measure of an individual is this room, I feel like we've done something amazing because you look amazing and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not whelmed, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, you know, uh, I was going to quote Vito Russo because he's one of my heroes. I probably will. But I, I think a place for me to start is James Joyce. Uh, there's a line from Ulysses where uh, Leopold Bloom realizes that in the midst of death we are in life, um, not the other way around. And if the one thing I've learned from our work in the epidemic is that life is what it's about. Fighting for it, securing it, protecting it, living it, dying for it, making it happen. Life, l'chaim, it is life. You know, in the, in the Dell, uh, there's a, one of the rocks says l'chaim, to life. Um, that's not a toast to me. That's not, that's not a, a well wish to me. That for me is a challenge. That for me is a direct challenge on how I'm supposed to live my life. The goal of our existence is life, to preserve it, to protect it, to make sure that people have it and that people have it equitably. When we talk about in this city getting to zero. We talk about our achievements in the epidemic. 
uh, which are accurate and true and unfucking believable. <laughs> and at the same time, it's not enough. There is no getting to zero until everybody gets to zero. There's just no other way around it. There's no way to talk about life unless everybody has equity and safety and decency and justice. I've been saying this recently, but I'm tired of the word disparity. Disparity is how we name it and walk away from it. It's about justice. And I think that's... A and I really, I really, really, really think if there's anything you take home, other than the fact that you saw me have a feeling, um, <laughs> is that our job is justice. Um, when African Americans make up 5% of the city's population, but are 16% of the population living with HIV and 26% of the homeless population with HIV, there's no justice. That's not okay. That has to stop. <laughs> and I do mean to temper tonight's amazement with some sobriety. Um, it's not enough that we celebrate. It's not enough that we acknowledge. It's enough that we move towards life. I mean, we're in the middle of a memorial, and I, and I dare you to tell me what it is about this memorial that makes it different. Some people think it's the architecture, the landscape, or the 250,000 volunteer hours that have made this place what it is. I don't think that's it at all. I think the reason why we have the memorial is what makes us different, not how we have the memorial. There are three key words about this place that everyone knows. It's hope, it's healing, and it's remembrance. I think we've all been through enough trauma that we know what remembrance feels like. And I think we're all in the midst of healing. Some better, I'm better at it some days, worse at it most days, but I think we're all in the path of healing. I think, though, when we talk about justice and talk about equity and life, it's about hope. It's about how we situate ourselves in this planet about people who need people who are like us and who are not like us. I'm never at a loss for words, but I really, you know, I've had the privilege of serving on the board of directors of The Grove now for almost a decade, and I can't think of a more amazing group of individuals that I've been surrounded with in my lifetime. So for all the board members of The Grove, past and present, and there are some future ones here too, thank you. Thank you for letting me be part of you. Thank you for helping me come back to life. Uh, and thank you for keeping this place alive. Um, and I would also be remiss to not point out the amazing staff that we have here. Um, you've all, you all know John Cunningham. John turned to me a, a few moments ago before I came on stage and he said, you know, we've actually created something really great here together. Um, and I think that's true. And I think that's true in large part due to John and Steve Sagasser. Where is Steve? Where are you, Stevie? Over there. And Matt Kennedy. This is the 32nd year now that I've been living with HIV. Um, and in the circle of friends, uh, I put one of my closest friends' names in there a couple of years ago, a friend of mine named Patrick Leach. Um, when Patrick was dying, uh, before he went into a coma, this is a true story, before he went into a coma, he looked at me and he said, just face it, Mike, you're just too mean to die. <laughs> and then he went into a coma, right, and I'm, seriously, right after that, he went into a coma. And so, imagine being the person to tell his mom what his last words were. <laughs> but, you know, in 32 years, I never imagined this is where I would be. I never imagined that this is where we would be. Um, if anybody knows what this place used to look like before 1991, it was derelict beyond derelict. It was a dumping ground. It is, as much as I hate it, a perfect metaphor for the way we responded to the epidemic. We have reclaimed, we own, we take care of, and we repair. <laughs> so so I, want, I want to close there. I really want to close there on, on, on this last note. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of my dearest, dearest, dearest soulmates and I came up with this agreement that every year we start the year with a word. Um, it's our compact. Um, it's a word that we share that is about setting our intention for the year. 
Um, and that word sometimes is a phrase. Um, it's been a lot of different things. But in choosing a word, and I think the word that I want to choose for us is justice, but in choosing the word, the idea was that we needed to move beyond comfort. We needed to move beyond what was just where we were comfortable with each other, but move to a place where we could just actually challenge the soul of another human being. And I challenge you all to find that person in your life and find that compact in your life and make it. And I'm gonna leave you with this. Uh, on my birthday, I went back to New York and I got to see Angels in America on Broadway again. Um, I probably am the only gay man who has never seen a single show on Broadway except Angels in America. Uh, and I think I will die happy with that too. Uh, but at the very end of Angels in America, Pryor delivers a monologue that uh, I think is really, really quite Quite to the point. He says, this disease will be the end of many of us, but not nearly all. And the dead will be commemorated. And we'll struggle on with the living. And we are not going away. We won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. Bye now. Your fabulous creatures, each and every one of you, and I bless you. More life. A great work for you. Just yet. I'd like to call up State Senator Scott Wiener and Supervisor Raphael Mandelman. So let's hear it from Mike Shriver. So I, I have the honor of being Mike's neighbor. I live right down the street from him. We get to see him all the time. Uh, and uh, I also am an admirer. Uh, and to me, when I think of Mike, there are two things uh, that I think of. First, I'm reminded that you can be one of the toughest, most tenacious, and most kick-ass uh, activists in existence, and you can still be one of the kindest, most decent people around. So someone, and the two go hand in hand, fighting so, so hard because you care so deeply about this community, and you are just a hero. Uh, someone who might reflect the strength of this community. It's a community that's been beaten down so many times by society, by government, by a virus, and we keep coming back. And it's because of people like you, Mike, uh, because of people who just will not give up. And you are uh, just an inspiration to me uh, and to so many, and we love you. We love you, we love you. Congratulations. <laughs> Like Scott said, um, you are so adorable, and that video was so <laughs> wonderful. Um, I adore you, Mike Shriver. I am so glad that you are here, and I am so glad that we are here, and I am so grateful for everything you have done to make both of those things real. And so thank you, Mike Shriver. I'm not really here to tell you how much I adore you, although that was fun. I'm actually here to tell you that the city and county of San Francisco adores you. And Senator Wiener is here to tell you that the state of California adores you. Thank you, Mike Shriver.
the first and last time you're ever going to see me in a fitted suit. So. <laughs> It's now my privilege to call to the stage our fearless leader and executive director, John Pettingham. Well, talk about the caboose and talk about having to follow some real power. Mike, thank you for all that you've done serving with you and working with you over the last decade is one of the greatest and most deep blessings that I've had in my life. Although you may not be formally within the organization, we formed a great friendship, and I know that it will persevere. I'm gonna wind this down really quickly, so I'm gonna ask everyone to give me just the liberty of a few minutes. I have a few thank yous. I wanna again thank Quest, Wells Fargo, Macy's, Gilead, and Chevron for their generosity. I also want to thank the Board of Directors for their unwavering passion and commitment to the work that we do. I want to thank my staff, Steve, Matt, Deb, and Ray. Every day, you inspire me with your commitment and the dedication that you put into this. I also want to thank Jennifer Bing and Sarah Schwigler from Bing Consulting, who have made all of this possible tonight. I want to thank my husband, Joel, for putting up with me through putting all this together. Thank you, Joel. And I want to also thank all of the dedicated volunteers that for the last week have worked tirelessly to help put this together and who are serving you tonight and you're here out of the kindness and generosity of their heart. Thank you, volunteers. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for making tonight an incredible success. <laughs> Nearly three decades ago, the idea for this memorial for AIDS was first conceived. The original vision was a space, excuse me if I could please have your attention for a minute. Thank you. The original vision was to create a space to remember those lost through healing, hope, and remembrance. To a large extent, we have delivered on the original vision of this memorial, and like a pebble in a pond, this space and all of you have sent ripples of healing far and wide, far beyond the physical confines of this space. The National AIDS Memorial is an organization. We are the cornerstone and the keeper of the stories of the epidemic. And in so doing, we preserve the legacy of what took place. We preserve our own legacy and our own story. For it is through remembering and storytelling that the lives of those that we've lost will live on forever in our hearts and our souls, one generation to the next. One of the greatest blessings that I've been given in this role is the opportunity to hear your stories and to hear many stories. Oftentimes I get to hear those stories in the first person and therefore bear witness. My heart has been filled with so many and tonight I would like to share one with you. Tonight again, we are pleased to have with us Edith Lambert and Howard Hardiman. For over two decades, they have annually made a pilgrimage to this space from Northern New Hampshire and New York City. Like so many of us, they are connected through shared grief, but more importantly, by their shared love for Mark Lambert, Edith's son and Howard's partner, who they lost in 1993. After Mark's passing, a group would gather at the Plaza Hotel in New York to remember Mark and to tell stories. On the third anniversary, in 1996, Edith shared that she had seen a story on TV about a memorial to AIDS in San Francisco and that she wanted to put Mark's name in the circle of friends. The following year, they made their first trek together and have faithfully returned every year since, sometimes with others, but always together. 
Edith and Howard may have lost Mark, but in his memory, they have created a beautiful relationship and forged a mother-son bond. Together, they have seen this pace, space transformed and are given great comfort knowing that Mark will forever be remembered in this space of love and beauty. Edith and Howard, you inspire me and thank you for showing us that healing and hope are possible through remembrance. Edith and Howard, would you please stand up? Edith and Howard are right here. Five years ago, this organization forged a strategic plan for the future, and one of the four pillars was centered on capturing, curating, and preserving the stories of the epidemic. Tomorrow, we will formally announce the merger of the HIV Story Project into the National AIDS Memorial family. After four years of courting, we finally decided to wed. This, this merger will continue to expand our commitment to storytelling, but it will also leverage the amazing work done by the HIV Story Project over the last decade, and specifically by its co-founders, York Folkley and Mark Schmolowitz. For we are committed to ensuring that the story of the epidemic will live on far after we are all gone to ensure that the lessons are known by future generations and those stories that Mike referenced of justice will live on. Tonight I'm inviting you to join me and all of us here at the National AIDS Memorial and help us secure the stories of the future. Not just the stories, but also the history and our shared legacy. We need your support. So if you would please do me a favor and take out your phones, you know what we're doing. All right, yeah, I, you haven't fallen off the turnip cart recently. So if you take out your phones, please. Phones out? Yes, sir. Okay, text. It's all on the screens. 56512. Again, 56512. Text an amount. Text your name or a message, which will then scroll on the screen. Again, we cannot do it without you. I so appreciate every one of you being here. Mike, again, congratulations on this honor. And again, thank you for supporting your National AIDS Memorial. And we'll see you tomorrow at 12 noon for the 25th Annual National Observance of World AIDS Day. Thank you very much. Thank you.